of last year. It's Art's interview with Captain Bill Miller on the mysterious Tampa Triangle. Art is still out with the flu, but should be back for Dreamland live next week. And now, classic Dreamland on this, the absolute best of Art Bell. I'm Art Bell. Good evening. Dreamland underway, where we do and talk about very strange things, and tonight is going to definitely be no exception. First thing we're going to do is talk with a man named Robert Bodell. And this is something we kind of plucked from nowhere. Uh, Robert, where are you uh, located? Uh, I'm in uh, Ruskin, Florida. Okay. Uh, is that How far is that from Tampa? Uh, it's about maybe 30 minutes south. I'm on the... Uh, very end of Tampa Bay. Oh, okay. So you're near Tampa. Yeah. And uh, you sent me a fax, and I just thought the audience ought to hear uh, from you what happened. Uh, you, you're a sailor? You sail? or? Yeah, I do a lot of uh, sailboat deliveries. Okay. And so you were apparently delivering a boat from Tampa to Long Island. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, that's correct. All right. So you were by yourself? Yeah, uh, most most of my deliveries are single-handed. All right, tell everybody what happened to you. Well, I had, uh, of course, I went around the southern tip of Florida and up the east coast to Long Island, which takes me right through the Bermuda Triangle. I've been there a lot of times and see, seen some strange stuff, but you know, it just you know, just not any big deal. By the way, um, you mentioned QSL card. That's amateur radio talk. Are you a ham? Uh, no, no. I, uh, I listen to uh, shortwave a lot when I'm on the boat. So you're a shortwave li li listener. Okay. Yes. Uh, then I understand why you made reference. All right. So what happened? Uh, you say you, you've been through the Bermuda Triangle many times. Uh, weird things have occurred? Uh, yeah, yeah. See, the compass card start to spin and uh, strange hazes. Th those things really happen? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> they did to me. They did to you. Yeah. All right, but that is not what this is all about. I mean, t you said in your fax, uh, or your email, that's almost ho-hum. I yeah. mean, that things go wrong in the triangle. Yeah. So what did happen? Uh, when I got to New York, uh, my logbook was off three days. I'd lost three days in it. Um, are you sure that you did not simply start in the wrong place in your logbook? Uh, no. Well, the first thing the first thing I did was to call back here to Florida to my mother and check with her on the day that, that I left, and that jibed. Do you have any idea, by your logbook or by any other method, you know, method of measurement, where you lost the three days? Uh, I have no idea because... Uh, Amongst other things in my logbook, I keep track of uh, shortwave radio programs, you know, in case I decide to send off for a QSL card. Right. And the book includes the date, the time, which I keep by uh, WWV, National Bureau of Standards. Right. Uh, the program content, people's names, names of songs, the times all this stuff happens. And... When I couldn't find any mistakes in my logbook, why, uh, I sent off for the QSL cards, and they all came back. So you kept a very meticulous entry. Uh, there must have... So what, what happened in your logbook then? There was simply a final entry, and then it was three days from that date? Uh, my final entry was uh, coming to the dock in Long Island. Wow. Uh, do you have... Was was there anything at all that you can recall that occurred before this or during the trip that was particularly unusual? I mean, had uh, for example, you went through the Bermuda Triangle. Did you get the normal compass spinning business or haze or anything like that on that trip? Uh, well, there was there was uh, one stretch there for about a three or four hours that I just I just felt. Strange. You just felt strange. Yeah. Um. In all the time, how long ago did that occur now? Uh, this has been probably, oh, I'd say about 
10, 12 years ago. 10 or 12 years ago. And uh, in all the time since then, nothing has occurred to you uh, further to explain how you lost three days? No. <laughs> it's a total mystery. A total mystery. Well, Bob, I want to thank you um, because it kind of leads into where we're going. Mysterious things seem to happen uh, down around the Tampa area and uh, on up into the Bermuda Triangle. And uh, I guess you just you have nothing to offer in terms of what you think it might be. Uh, no, not at all. In fact, it was I had heard about the Bermuda Triangle and all that, and sailing through it. And, you know, some of the strange stuff started happening. You know, in the beginning, so I started looking into it, and I've never found any explanation for anything. <laughs> Well, I really, really, really appreciate it, Bob. And uh, I know that you took a little uh, time off work to be able to tell us this. And I appreciate your uh, coming on the program. Okay, well, I appreciate uh, you having me. It's been a pleasure. Take care, Bob. Um, you know, that's just a regular guy, folks. He sent me uh, some email, and he maintained an absolutely meticulous log on a trip from... Uh, Tampa, up to New York, in three days, went away. Three days. Now, this is not the only kind of thing that goes on there. In a moment, you'll hear a lot more about the Tampa area, because coming up, Captain Bill Miller, he's a, um, a United States Coast Guard licensed captain, has authored a book called the Tampa Triangle, and that's where we're going next. Are you overweight? Would you like to lose an called the Tampa Triangle? And from the St. Petersburg Times, I'm going to read a little bit of an article entitled Tales of the Unexplainable. From chupacabras to hitchhiking ghosts, it seems the Tampa Bay area is one weird little place. Not so little, actually. And uh, it begins, imagine Rod Serling is standing before you, his hands clasped in front of him, his eyebrow cocked, he speaks. Consider, if you will, a series of extremely bizarre events taken individually. They're noteworthy, but not especially alarming. A woman bursts into flames while sitting in her living room. Fishing boats disappear without a trace from the Gulf of Mexico. A young blonde woman is repeatedly seen to be hitchhiking on the Sunshine Highway, uh, make that Skyway Bridge, but she too keeps disappearing. A Nazi submarine sinks in the Gulf of Mexico during World War II, and more than 50 years later, people still refuse to even talk about it. And then, of course, the Chupacabra sightings. The ghost sightings at the Don Cesar Resort and Haslam's bookstore and the people who swear they've had a close encounter with old Hitler, a hammerhead shark the size of, get this, a Ford Explorer that originally uh, uh, patrols the bay. These events did not occur in various cities across the country. No, they all occurred in the same place. Tampa Bay, Florida. And from Tampa Bay, well, actually not from Tampa Bay at the moment. I think he's probably in New York. Here is Captain Bill Miller. Captain? Good evening, New York. Good evening, Dreamland listeners. Yes, I'm <laughs> calling from Staten Island, New York. I'm up here working on a dredge survey job uh -huh. on a boat in the harbor. All right. Well, um, how long have you been uh, a seafaring man? Oh, uh, most of my adult life, and I've spent the last 15 years or so as a, as a captain. All right. Uh, before we get into what you've done, uh, you heard the, the nice gentleman I had on a moment ago. That's right. Um, um, Bob Bodell. Yeah. Now, he, he was a, just a, he's just a, you could tell when you listen to him, just an average guy. But here's somebody who lost, lost three days on a trip from Tampa to New York. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Yes, and, and Bob is an excellent example of a professional boat captain. He keeps meticulous log entries. Uh, he's paying attention to what, what's going on. He's not easily flapped. And yet, 
here the man's ma and he's made this trip several times all of a sudden he's missing three days and he's a good example of what uh, is known as the missing time phenomena and I think uh, frequently that's been attributed to uh, UFO abductees so perhaps Bob has been a victim of abduction I don't know perhaps um, but also we hear about um, uh, we hear about this mist and uh, the compass business in the uh, Bermuda Triangle. Yes, in fact, I've seen the green mist off of Key Biscayne. Green mist? It, it was a green cloud. I can't explain what exactly it was. I was out there for several months. I was doing a survey of the Gulf Stream, and every day we'd go out and throw a buoy overboard and track it. So we were in the same area twice a day for months, and one day there was a green fog just off of Key Biscayne, and of course right away we turned on all our electronics, our radar and everything we had, and I sure fired up the engines quick because I didn't want to get caught in it. And then it was there, and, and, and it was gone, just suddenly. And uh, I had a civil engineer with me aboard the boat, and he's a real skeptical guy. And I said, well, uh, uh, how do you explain that one? And uh, he didn't have an explanation for that one. Um, all right, what about all your electronics? Uh, did anything tell you that something was going crackers? I mean, what about the compass? Any other magnetic uh, uh, or heading equipment that would tell you what, something weird is going on? We lost our GPS and we lost oh. our, our radios. There was a lot of static on the radios. I had the radar up and running, but it didn't show anything. That's the radar sure. showed nothing. You lost radios and you lost GPS. Right. Now, GPS is um, a constellation of satellites right. that orbit the Earth. So you, you lost low-frequency radio, and you lost uh, the spectrum all the way up through satellite. Yes, and it came back shortly after the cloud uh, disappeared. So I, I don't know. It was like a fog, like a low fog, but it wasn't a fog because it was a beautiful morning, and it was there, and then it was gone. So it was an interesting phenomenon to see. Well, fog I've seen, green fog, I've never seen. Right. And I don't, see, don't yeah. particularly care to see, as a matter of fact. Right, and I see fog all the time. I know the difference. Uh-huh. All right. Um, well, we've moved a little bit away um, from what we really wanted to talk about, and that is uh, Tampa. Oh, we know about the Bermuda Triangle. What is the Tampa uh, Triangle? And then, and then further, what your book is actually called Tampa Triangle Dead Zone. That's pretty ominous. What do you mean, dead zone? Okay. Well, Tampa Triangle is the uh, describes the atmosphere of par paranormal activity in the Tampa Bay area, and the dead zone is an actual stretch of shipping channel in the Tampa Bay shipping. Uh, the Tampa Bay shipping channel is 48 miles long, and yet okay. one small stretch of channel, four miles long, there's been over three major maritime disasters with a loss of over 58 lives. And when you, when you consider, you, a lot of people say, well, you know, gosh, there's shipwrecks all the time. Well, I'm up here in New York Harbor. There's tons of bridges. There's all kinds of ships coming and going like crazy, and yet they don't have anything like the shipwrecks we've had in this short little benign stretch of shipping channel in southern, lazy southern Tampa Bay, Florida. Apparently not so benign. No. In fact, it's a relatively straight stretch of channel, and yet in 1980, in January of 1980, a Coast Guard vessel was outbound. It was a buoy tender, the Blackthorn, and it had a head-on collision with an inbound oil tanker. This is at 8 o'clock at night. It's, it's almost unfathomable that a Coast Guard cutter would have a collision with anything, let alone a huge oil tanker. Well, don't both ships have lights and radar and all that kind of stuff? Right, exactly. So uh, so how could that how could that occur? Well, I mean, we, I, I, you would imagine that at least one of the ships would see the lights of the other or would detect the other with radar. I mean, ships are not small things. Yes, exactly. They're like huge city blocks moving yeah. down a shipping channel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. And and yet they, they almost collided head on. In fact, the tanker's anchor dropped on the side of the buoy tender. And after all, the anchor chain ran out. The anchor line came tight and it caused the buoy tender to capsize. 23 Coast Guardsmen died in that disaster. Oh my God. The largest peacetime Coast Guard disaster in the nation's history. There must have been an official investigation. Well, there was a lot of finger pointing that went on, of course. Of and, course. And, and uh, But eventually, 
everyone pretty much walked away without any blame or too much blame. You know, they said the Coast Guard guys weren't really paying attention, and they pretty much exonerated the guy on the tanker. Uh, but uh, So they really had to find an official way to um, sort of spread the blame around and not clobber anybody. But the yeah. truth was they simply could not explain it. Right. And then three months later, an inbound light freighter, an inbound light freighter is coming up the bay, and it runs into the Sunshine Skyway Bridge and knocks it down. What? 35 people died. What? Yep. The freighter was inbound. All of a sudden, and all this activity ha happens right around the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. What were the uh, weather conditions like at the time? A, a freak storm blew up just before the, the ship reached the bridge. It was less than a mile away from the bridge when a horrific rainstorm blew up. High winds, gale force winds, and fierce rain. It was sudden. It was quick. Okay. The pilot didn't have a chance to stop the ship. He continued on course. He'd done it over 800 times. He'd made over 800 passages through the bridge. He felt confident he could make it. He saw the bridge on his radar. Everything looked good. And yet somehow he got 800 feet off course and knocked the bridge down. 35 people died as a result. There was many cars that went over the broken bridge and even a Greyhound bus. The course recorder on the ship, the ship had a course recorder, uh -huh. very similar to a black box on an airplane. Sure. The course recorder showed the ship dead on in the center of the shipping channel passing under the bridge. Good Lord. And well, again, there had to have been, uh, as there is with every maritime disaster, there had to have been an investigation. They exonerated the pilot of the ship. They said he acted with due care under the circumstance. So he was exonerated. An interesting sidebar on, on that uh, shipping disaster story is the ghost of the Greyhound bus. A Greyhound bus went over that bridge that morning. Y yes. And, and 25 passengers aboard died along with the bus driver. And many people have... Uh, what? The, the original bridge has been knocked down and there's now fishing piers there and they built a nice big new bridge. Wait, wait, wait. You mean they died because they plunged into the water? Yes, the, the, the uh, Greyhound bus plunged over the abyss where the, the center span of the bridge was knocked down, and the bus plunged 150 feet to the water, and all aboard were killed. But people have seen the ghost of the Greyhound bus. Fishermen have been fishing out on the, uh, the Skyway Bridge out there yes. early in the morning. It's foggy. They hear the high-pitched sound of rubber tires, big truck tires on the pavement, and they turn to look. And they see the bus coming. It's a Greyhound bus. And as it approaches closer, they can see the driver. And he's, his hands are gripping the wheel, and he's looking straight ahead, and he looks scared. And then as the bus goes past, they see all the passengers in the bus, and they're sitting in their seats, and they're all staring straight ahead, except for the last window. The last window on the side of the bus, there's a woman looking out, and she's smiling, and she's waving her hand mechanically. And then the bus is gone. And you know, you can't imagine how that freaks me out. I um, it launches me into a into a discussion about what a ghost is. Um, I mean, we all imagine we have a soul, and that when we die, it you know it moves somewhere else, hopefully in an up direction. But uh, I hear stories like this, and it sounds like it sounds like. A place of the damned, you know, uh, having to relive some horrible, horrible end again and again and again. We have a local psychic named Caroline Hart. She's a wonderful woman, and she's worked with several of the families of passengers who were aboard the bus that morning. And she says, uh, a quote from her is that, uh, Caroline Hart says, in regards to the visuals that the fishermen are getting about the bus load of people looking straight ahead, yes. it, it may be the collective consciousness of those spirits that are still trapped in the energy field of the bus. It creates a visual scene based upon the awareness of impending disaster, which is held on to by the spirits of those that went into the water. But it doesn't answer the question about whether these whether the immortal souls of these poor people are really trapped doing this again and again or whether it's some kind of weird echo left from a tragedy it's a question i've been trying to answer about ghosts and poltergeists and those sorts of apparitions which seem damned to go through the same thing again and again and again 
And I can only hope that it is not really the soul of these people, but some sort of... <laughs> I don't know. I wish I did know. Some sort of echo. Do you have a theory? Either way. I. It's a good question. Yeah, it's an important question. Particularly if you're the family of one of those people. Or, I suppose, one of those people. All right, uh, uh, Captain Miller, stand by. We'll be back to you. Uh, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, you know, let's stick on the subject of ghosts for, for a few moments. Uh, because this has been driving me absolutely crazy. It's, frankly, one of the reasons that I do this program. In other words, we, we look into life after death in lots of different ways. And uh, one of them, obviously, has got to be ghosts. If you can prove there are ghosts, then I think that you prove that there is an existence beyond the physical. So it's very, very, very important. And there are other examples down within the Tampa Triangle of ghost activity, aren't there? Yes, sir. In fact, right on the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, the same place where the ghost of the Greyhound bus is frequently seen, is the ghost of the blonde hitchhiker. Now, in the folklore of ghost uh, literature, there's many instances of hitchhikers that are ghosts. But we have one on the Sunshine Skyway Bridge that is seen by so many people that it's become regular for for cars with out-of-state plates to pull up to the toll plazas on either side of the bridge and report this ghost. And uh, what they describe is this. They say as they're driving along the road, and usually these are, are uh, senior citizens or older people or, or professional people, people who would normally not stop for a hitchhiker. And yet they see this young woman standing by the side of the road, and she looks like she's disheveled or maybe she's just had a fight with her boyfriend or something. Right. Perhaps they're reminded of their own daughter. So uh, they break with their normal rule of not picking up hitchhikers, and they stop and they pick this young woman up. Right. And she gets into the back seat of the car. Now, they say that she uh, appears to be dressed in 70s fashion. She has a white peasant blouse and, I think, a jean skirt and, and uh, long blonde hair, which appears to be disheveled. And she climbs into the back seat of the car, and they, they continue forward, and they, they have conversation with this woman as they crest the bridge, as they're going up the incline to the top of the bridge. And, and then as they get to the apex of the bridge, the top of the bridge, they, they hear no noise in the back seat. The woman's not talking. And, and when they turn around to look, they don't see her. And they think, well, gosh, perhaps she's passed out or something. Maybe she's fallen down onto the floor. So they, they really look over the back seat. And that's when they see she's gone. Gone. And not there. She's disappeared. So then they stop at the toll plaza, at, at, which is on either side of the bridge, and they, they tell what happened to them. And, and the toll plaza people have had so many people stop and, and tell them about this that they're pretty blasé about it. And they say, yes, yes, we'll tell the highway patrol and, and go on and, and about their business. In fact, one of the toll plaza, the lady that is the manager of the North Toll Plaza on the Sunshine Skyway Bridge has actually seen the ghost herself. And she's a pretty uh -huh. responsible witness. Um, um, what history is there of this young lady? I mean, do we know that she was killed at that location or that a blonde was killed or any, anything at all? One psychic has uh, has said that they feel that it, it's a woman who uh, rode her moped to the top of the bridge and jumped. Yeah, there we go. Let me tell you one. You're supposed to be here telling ghost stories, but let me tell you one that I've had verified by... Um, literally hundreds of people and this one gives me the heebie-jeebies it the story comes from san antonio and um i i can't recall the name of the road although i knew it it involves a railroad crossing i wonder if you know the story um a, a school bus full of children um got stuck on a uh, between the um uh, the, you know the the, the railroad bri the, the railroad tracks. It got stuck right on the tracks and in between the things that come down, or there were none there. And I'm I'm trying to re recall this exactly right. A train hit that bus. It killed I forget how many children. Uh, I believe all of the children in the bus, or the majority of them. And um, every um, every night of the week, you can go to that location. And you can stall a car um, on the tracks. And uh, I mean so that the engine will not uh, 
a start, you can stall it, even though a train is not coming, and you can get in your car, and people have take uh, to be sure of this, they have uh, taken talcum powder and spread it across the back of their car, um, and guess what? Uh, you get into your car, and something pushes your car uh, out uh, 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 from sitting on top of the tracks as if uh, it doesn't matter what, whether your brake is on or whatever. And this is a true story. And inevitably, you go back to the back of the car and you look, and there are small handprints on the back of the car. My, wow, that's an amazing story. Um, it's a worrisome story, along with what you've told. In other words, those children, or the spirits of those children, appear to be there pulling people out of danger, so the same thing, obviously, cannot occur to them. And it goes back again to what the heck is a ghost. If it's an immortal soul caught in um, a, some sort of um, a damnation, then we've got a lot to think about, don't we? If it's just some sort of weak echo of what happened and doesn't really mean the soul of that person is doing it again and again, then perhaps it's something else. It's one of the mysteries I would like to solve. Anyway, back to the Tampa Triangle. Well, um, let, me, let me tell you real quick about uh, the ghost of the romantic trout fisherman. This is a, a ghost, the spirit of a man who's only seen by women. And there's a, there's a park right out by the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. It's a very popular county park. Yes. And, and women report going out to the park, and they're, they're out there fishing, and they report seeing a very handsome man in his late 30s or early 40s, and he's wading along the flats, casting his, his lure out, trout fishing. And, and he gets closer to him, and he's kind of smiling at him and kind of flirting and winking, but he doesn't speak. And, and when, they, when he seems to get closer, you know, they kind of move down the shore trying to get a little closer, hoping maybe he'll speak to them and they can get something going. And as they get closer, he disappears. And, and the women have, have gone to the bait shop and, and talked about this and mentioned it to the bait shop clerk. And the, the bait shop clerk says, Oh, you saw Dalton, the ghost of the romantic trout fisherman. And uh, he's only seen by women. Only by women. All right. We did a show once, uh, an entire program, on spontaneous human combustion. Right. It is a very strange topic, uh, Captain. As a matter of fact, I've got some photographs uh, of one doctor, for example, who burned up. They're very gory up on my website, and all that you, you see is this spot. Uh, he was in the bathroom doing his thing at the moment that he burned. And all that's left is his leg and the charred remains of a very incredibly intense fire uh, that occurred locally. Didn't even set the house on fire. Charred it. Uh, in fact, burned right through the floor, but didn't set any of the rest of the house on fire, but burned him up completely with the exception of one leg. Pretty horrible, but it's a real photograph. And... Um, I understand there was a combustion incident in the Tampa Triangle, wasn't there? That's right. The, one, perhaps one of the most studied scientifically instances of spontaneous human combustion did occur right here in St. Petersburg, Florida, in the heart of the Tampa Triangle. Uh, it was the case of Mary Harder Reeser. And, you know, what you're saying is right. Uh, it, it just takes incredible hate to consume a body. Funeral directors say that to cremate, cremate a human body, it takes temperatures of at least 2,500 to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit what for heard. several hours yep. to reduce the body. And even then they have to put the bones and the leftover parts into like a big dryer that's got steel balls and it, and it pulverizes everything. It's called a cremulator. So, yet, so to, to get a human being to dust requires what you just described. Yeah, incredible, incredible heat. And yet, in these cases of spontaneous human combustion, the thing that's most baffling is that uh, very flammable objects right next to the person are maybe covered with a little suit or, or grimy with uh, that's right. smoke, but they don't go up in flames. And we're talking about curtains and drapery and, you know, simple things that would, would go up in a heartbeat. I know. So the implication is it really is internal or it begins internally in the human body. What about this particular case? What happened? Well, Mary Reeser uh, was a widow. Her husband was a, uh, a doctor. And when he died, she moved down to St. Petersburg, Florida, to live, to live near her son, who was also a doctor. Sure. 
and uh, she she was sitting. In fact, she, this happened right around the corner from my sister's house. This happened in the early fifties. She was sitting in her easy chair and just went up and smoke. And and the amazing thing was that there was there wasn't a lot of smoke that came out of the apartment or anything. None of the furnishings were damaged, and all that was left was her foot. Everything else what? was <laughs> what? All, yeah, all that was left with her when the fireman came in. Her landlord did smell smoke in the morning, finally. But it wasn't like it was. In fact, the landlord thought that the insulation on the irrigation pump had overheated or, you know, had burned through. And so it wasn't a major smoke that she was smelling. And, and so when they finally opened the door to Mary Harder Reese's apartment and went inside, they found this burned easy chair yeah. and a foot and nothing more. Sounds exactly like what I described to you. Yes, oh, it God. did. Um, firemen say, firemen say, you know, that if somebody, they, they go to a lot of places where people have died from smoking in bed or whatever. Sure. And, and they talk about the, this one fire captain said, well, you know, it's kind of like meat that's been burned on the barbecue grill or something. It, it's burned, but it's not consumed totally to ash. It's just. It's uh, actually, just, actually, I think it's impossible. In other words, um. Uh, without there being something else at work here, I think it's just absolutely impossible. I, uh, w w what percentage of the human body is water? Right. I mean, uh, it's tremendous. Just a whole bunch. Most, most of us, uh, we're, we're made up of water. Right. We're, we're not flammable, <laughs> particularly. Uh, okay. So it's just uh, it's just flat impossible. Uh, do you have any ideas? I mean, I thought I would ask uh, you what you think could do that. Well, the the FBI came in and examined the case, and and they their finding was that it was unusual and improbable. They determined that no known chemical agents were involved. It wasn't smoking. Unusual and improbable. Is that the actual? That's the actual finding from the FBI. <laughs> which is kind of like double talk for we don't know what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that also occurred in that same triangle area. Yes, sir. Now, it's, it's incumbent on me as we discuss these stories to ask you, um, how do you document that things are occurring in a specific area um, at a more frequent rate, um, internal human combustion, ships uh, plowing into bridges or into each other, uh, more so than uh, down in the Florida Keys or... Uh, up there in New York, where you are right now, how do you how do you come to the conclusion that you've got a special area? Well, that's that's a real good point. A lot of people say, "Well, geez, it's just a shipwreck or something like that." And then, of course, you look at New York Harbor, where there's tons of shipping, and they have relatively few shipwrecks, or only fender benders. And yet, in this one small stretch of channel, we've had three major maritime disasters. And as I started looking at those three, mar in fact, that's how I started writing the book or writing the story was about. Uh, how things happen in threes. Threes. And as I started researching it in the library, I started turning over all these other unusual maritime events that took place in the dead zone. Huh. And, and for years, people that I've worked with on the waterfront have called that the dead zone, and that's because their radars fail or their electric uh, steering goes out or their hydraulic steering. They, they have all kinds of unusual malfunctions right in this relatively small stretch of channel. And this is after crossing oceans and everything. Mm -hmm. So... What I tried to do was document it, and I footnoted everything that I found with the source, of course, and everything. Okay, but it's not specific to the water, is it? In other words, it seems specific to the area, both land and water, above the water, on the land, in, yes. in the water. Yes, in fact, just this past Christmas, uh, a week before Christmas, uh, the vi uh, an apparition of the Virgin Mary appeared on a glass building in Clearwater, Florida. Really? It, it was a huge uh, 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 you know what? image of the Virgin Mary. I think that I, uh, I may have heard about that. I think the Associated Press or somebody did a story on that. It was a big story. Uh -huh. The image of the Virgin Mary appeared on this glass building, the glass face of the building. And nobody could explain it. And, of course, the skeptics right away said... Uh, it's well water on the on the glass, except that this image uh, was three or four stories high. And just by chance, they had a, a convention of glass scientists from Pittsburgh Plate Glass, and these are the top guys in the industry. So the, so the local newspaper loaded all these scientists onto the bus and brought them over to the Virgin Mary, naturally, uh, you know, to see what they said. 
and they couldn't explain it. And these are the guys that, you know, are really into glass, and they could not explain how this was on there. Are there any photographs of this? Oh, yes. In fact, it's, it's very big. Uh, it's a very big thing. It's in Clearwater, Florida. Uh, the image of the Virgin Mary. In fact, the owners of the building are kicking the tenants out, and they're turning it into a shrine. Really? So they've had over a million visitors since December. Well, to this. Uh, Captain, I have a, I have a kind of a theory about these things, and um, I don't know whether you want to hear it or not. It involves. I wrote a book called The Quickening, which, by the way, folks, please don't call. You cannot order it right now. It's not even available. It's all sold out. But the idea, Captain, is that things on this earth, uh, human behavior, social human behavior, the way we're treating each other, our economy, our ecology, uh, the environment, in other words, everything, the weather, you name it, everything is getting faster. Everything is speeding up at an exponential rate. And we're headed toward an event. And, and as we get closer to this event, things like uh, apparitions, Marian apparitions, and that sort of thing, are increasing. And they definitely are. And that's my theory about that. I, I believe we're, uh, we're being given a message of some kind. I'm not exactly sure what or what um, we're being told. But I suspect it has something to do with straightening out our act or else. Do you have any thoughts? I think you're right on target, Art. <laughs> well, I don't know that I want to be on target. I just think that it is, uh, it is going on. And it's particularly going on in the Tampa area. Um, would you spend time in that dead zone? Well, I, I sail through it quite frequently as, as part of my job. But as with most captains, I'm always real glad to get through it and get under the bridge. Captain Robert Trice, a good friend of mine, runs tugboats through there all the time. And he said when he passes through that bridge, he says the wheelhouse gets cold and clammy. He said he can almost feel the souls of the dead reaching up from the waters. He said it's a really eerie feeling. All right. Captain, hold tight. We'll get back to you in a moment. You almost feel the souls of the dead. Here we go again. And, uh, Captain, I've had several faxes already. One says, wasn't there a green fog at the Philadelphia experiment? Makes you wonder if it couldn't be somehow related from Sally in Washington State. Um, and Sally is exactly right. There was a green fog reported uh, when they did the Philadelphia experiment, uh, Captain. Had you heard that? Yes, great comment. Um, and one other that I want to read for you, Captain. You'll enjoy this. Maybe you even know about it. Hi, Art. I thought your guest, Captain Miller, should know about a very strange marine incident that occurred not far from where he's located on Staten Island, Friday, September 15th, 1995. Listen now, folks. The passengers aboard a Staten Island ferry boat were astonished to witness a huge object just to the left of their ferry as it was coursing to the south towards Staten Island. The object apparently simply rose out of the water between the ferry and Governor's Island. It paced the ferry for about eight to ten minutes and then simply disappeared from view. All the witnesses reported that the water was, quote, boiling unquote, underneath the object. It was as tall as a six to eight story building. It was even seen by police on the shore and the 911 facilities in New York City received multiple calls from other individuals who also saw it. Further, a videotape about the incident has been produced and aired in the New York area. I've got a copy of it, very interesting. I've talked to many of the individuals who were aboard the ferry who witnessed the object, and their stories are spine-chilling, very sincere. Thought you might like to know that the captain is sitting very close to the site of that event. Have you ever heard of that, Captain? No, but that's an exciting story, and I was on the Staten Island Ferry today. That's really a great story. Governor's Island is, of course, the Coast Guard base here, too. Yes, indeed.
But boy, that's a terrific story. That's right where I'm working. And uh, as, uh, that comes from the National UFO Reporting Center. It was just faxed to me, and I would love to get a copy of that uh, a video tape, Captain. So I guess strange things uh, occur at sea. Oh, boy, I'll tell you. And, oh, you, you talked about the Magellan GPS. Oh, excellent, yeah. excellent unit. It sets the standard for excellence in the GPS navigation industry. They're wonderful units. I know it, and uh, we, get, we can't keep them. Yep. We can't keep them. They sell out, and then uh, they're so sold out that we about every six months we get a shipment, and they go. Just top of the line. They're great. They're great units. Uh, real quick, real quick. Remember we were talking about Mary Harder Reeser, yes, the lady who spontaneously human combusted. Yes. Well, her spirit came back. Her her son, who was the doctor, reported that uh, family members would encounter her her ghost in their home, <sighs> and and they smelled the distinctive odor of her odor of her perfume, and it was particularly uh, uh, found powerful in in the guest room, which was entirely furnished with her furniture from her her home in Pennsylvania. The racer's dog, Riggles, refused to enter the guest room where the mother's furniture was kept. Dr. Reeser said that after they sold the furniture, the spirit left with the furniture. And uh, he said it wasn't the house that was haunted, it was Mother Reeser's furniture. Maybe she just loved it too much, Dr. Reeser said. And, and that's from a, a medical doctor uh, who has encountered his mother's ghost. That was kind of fun. Yeah. yeah. You know, how do you take all this in? I mean, how do you absorb it? When I absorb it, it puts me in a very strange state, uh, as I think I've already described to you, because I'm so concerned about what might come after. Uh, how do you assimilate all this information? I mean, you hear about all these things. You write about all these things. What does it do to you? It's been really exciting for me because I kind of just stumbled onto it. I didn't start out to write about the paranormal. I, I started to write out about shipping disasters. And yet, the more I looked into it, the more unusual events pop bubbled to the surface. All right. You know something also about the Chupacabra, don't you? Yes, that's right. Uh, in fact, there's been several sightings of the Chupacabra in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, I'm, not, I'm sure all of your listeners are familiar with the Chupacabra story. Uh, it's a very popular in the Hispanic community who, who've seen uh, many sightings of it. A, a lot of people feel that the Chupacabra, which is a, uh, I think it's been described as three to four feet tall uh, with spines like coming out of the back of its head. Mm -hmm. It's a, a blood sucking type animal. Uh, it, it's particularly tough on farm animals and livestock. Uh, there's been many sightings in Puerto Rico. A lot of people have suggested that the Chupacabra is perhaps a, a chemical weapons experiment by Castro or, or some other government that's gone bad. It wouldn't surprise me. I don't know. Um, are you able to document... Uh, or what are you able to document in terms of uh, not just sightings, but attacks on animals or even humans? Has there been any of that? Well... There's been some livestock mutilations right down where old, our, our buddy Bob, the captain, the boat captain lives, Bob Bunnell, uh -huh. in Ruskin. And Ruskin's a farming community. One of, the, one of the things that I heard is that they think that perhaps it's, it may have come up on the ships, which come up from the Caribbean. Oh. May have gotten, you know, there's been many sightings in Miami, which is a heavy shipping port. And Tampa, of course, has some shipping coming in from the Caribbean also. There was a car. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you probably saw the story, and it was uh, either near Fort Lauderdale, I believe Fort Lauderdale, somewhere between there and Miami, and a car was attacked. Jeez. And they actually uh, found teeth marks uh, on a bumper. Holy smoke. Yeah, I know. Holy smokes. Nobody wants to think about something like that. All right, listen, I would like to begin uh, taking some calls, uh, Captain. But if there's anything else you want to get in as we go, you just uh, feel free to drop it in, all right? Okay, great. All right, let's see what we can do. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Captain Bob Miller. Hi. Hello, Art. Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is uh, Bruce from Sarasota, Florida. Uh, good, Bruce. Turn your radio off, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. Quite all right. Hold while he turns off his radio. He's got some hum or something. Well, 
partner. I don't know what happened to you there. Sorry about that. Uh, first time caller line. You're on the air with Captain Bill Miller. Hello. Yeah, hi there. Um, this is Mike from Minneapolis. Hello, Mike. Um, I have a theory about the spontaneous human combustion. And uh, if you remember some discussions Art had with Mark Taylor Canfield. Yes. About the um, thing called sonoluminescence. Uh, this is Art you're talking about. Oh, Art. About. Hi, Art. Um, if you remember your discussion with Mark Taylor Canfield about sonoluminescence. Yes. Um, where sound waves were propagated through liquid, which caused um, within a hundredth of a second to uh, the liquid to heat within 10,000 degrees. If for some reason sound waves could start a chain reaction in a human, uh -huh. it could superheat the uh, blood which could heat to that 10,000 degrees. That's interesting. That's, uh, I, I appreciate that call. Um, I guess that's as good an explanation as any, uh, but not good enough. In other words, uh, I still, in my wildest dreams, cannot imagine what something made mainly of water can suddenly just burn, uh, burn to a cinder, leaving everything around it basically untouched. It, it's wild. Speaking of wild, wild card line, you're on the air with Captain Miller. Hello. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Good evening. Where are you? This is Robert from the San Joaquin Valley, California. Yes, sir. I've got two things, sir. Um, good evening, uh, Mr. Miller. Is good Captain evening. Miller? Yes, sir. Captain Miller. Captain Miller. How do you do, sir? Good evening. Uh, I'm looking here Tuesday, this June the 16th, 1992, from Associated Press. This pertains to the uh, submarine that you mentioned that disappeared. Yeah, it says here, 50 years ago, Nazi team invades Florida. It says that the Germans are welcome on the Florida beaches these days, but four who slipped ashore at the then deserted northern Florida beach 50 years ago today came by submarine, not an airliner. In the early morning of June the 16, 1942, four paddled a rubber raft ashore from U-boat 584. They struggled with four large waterproof cases containing enough explosives to level factories, blow up bridges and canals, and terrorize Americans in stores and train depots. They were part of a Nazi Operation Pistorius, which had begun in the United States before the war. The plan was for two teams to rendezvous in St. Louis July the 4th and begin a campaign of sabotage and terrorism that would be joined by later waves of German agents. The four who landed on Long Island were arrested in New York City. Two members of the Florida group were arrested in New York City and the other two were picked up in Chicago. The arrest occurred between June the 20th and June the 27th. The eight were convicted by a secret military tribunal on August the 2nd, 1942. Six of them were executed August the 8th in an electric chair in Washington, wow. D.C. The two others who had cooperated with authorities were imprisoned, then deported to Germany in 1948. The U-boat was never seen again. Wow. Um, all right, that, that'll put us straight into a story uh, from Captain Miller. Captain... There was something, wasn't there, about a Nazi submarine? That's right, and I'm familiar with his story. That's absolutely right. German submarines, Nazi submarines, were very common in the Florida war waters in the early part of the wa war. In fact, they picked off our shipping like sitting ducks because at that time we didn't have the blackout regulations in effect, and the tankers would go past Miami or go up the coast, right. and the suns would have to just go out, well, they'd get up on the surface and knock them out of the water. Uh, so, so sub-traffic in this area was very strong. Uh, I turned up, as I grew up in Tampa Bay, one reoccurring story which always interested me was the story of the sunken German U-boat that was supposed to be sunk off Tampa Bay. And every few years it would kind of pop to the surface and we'd all talk about it when we were fishing and stuff. But we, I never really got the details. So when I started looking into this book, that's one of the stories I researched. And it's the story of the U-166, which is a 1XC class German submarine. And its mission was to come over and lay mines in Tampa Bay to disrupt the shipbuilding effort. They had some shipbuilding factories up in Upper Tampa during the war. Would make sense. Right. It, it came to the surface, and this just happens to be, it was Halloween night in 1942. And it was late in the evening, and it had been, under, it had been submerged all day running on batteries. 
and it came to the surface just before dark to charge its batteries. And it, it just so happened that a U.S. naval blimp was in the area and saw its surface. And, of course, they radioed headquarters right away. Mm-hmm. And headquarters uh, radioed out to a destroyer escort to uh, attack the sub, track it down and attack it. Of course. Several hours of depth charging followed, and the sub ran out of power and ended up on the floor of the Gulf of Mexico. It was forgotten until the late 1950s when a fellow named Jim Hall, who's one of the greatest hard hat divers in the United States, was out doing what he calls junkyard diving. And that means he had some uh, relatives who were in the Navy, and they had uh, locations of wrecks, and he'd go out and search them for anything that might be of value. Right. Junkyard diver. So Jim Hall found the location of this German submarine, and he went out to dive on it. And what he did was he cut a hole in the bottom of it so that the atmosphere would stay inside the submarine. And then he climbed up through the bottom of the sub into the, into the sub. Makes sense. So there was still atmosphere in there. But he had to leave on his diving equipment because he didn't know how polluted the atmosphere was. Chemicals from the batteries and everything. Very ancient uh, and probably very polluted with all kinds of things. Human remains, oh God, you can only imagine. Well, listen, one of the first compartments he goes into, he opens the door, watertight door into the engine room. And as he shines his light around the engine room, he starts to see the corpses of the German sailors. Uh. But there's something odd about them. They're tanned. I and he looks a little closer, and he can't understand how these guys that could be under the water for 25, 20 wait, years. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, first of all, A, you said there was an atmosphere in there. Right. Second of all, there shouldn't have been anything but bones. Oh, no. Much less tanned. Tanned? Oh, yes, it's a watertight. The, remember, they have all the watertight doors closed, and the, en- and the engine room is separated from the other compartment. Yes. Standard operating procedure. He goes into the engine room, and he sees these bodies, and they're... The skin appears to be tanned, and when he looks closer, he realizes they really are tanned. They've been tanned like leather by the petroleum fumes in the engine room, the oil. Oh. So they were tanned. So then he moved forward into the next compartment and, and finally into the control room. And, yes, you're right, those, those remains were just skeletonized. But he said it was a very eerie thing. Anyway, he went on to search through the submarine. There wasn't really anything worth taking or having. Yeah. Um, I'd have been out of there when I saw the tanned sailors, uh, submariners. Creepy. <laughs> creepy <laughs> stuff. I would have been out of there. He's a tough guy. And a nice guy, too. Anyway, about this time, the government starts getting in touch with him. And they say, Jim, you got to leave this submarine alone. And Jim, who's dove on many wrecks, says, what's the big deal? He says, there's, there's sunk subs all around the coast of Florida, and there's several of them. And the government admits they're out there. What's the big deal about this one? Uh-huh. And, the, and he was told, Jim, we don't care about the submarine. It's what's near it that we're afraid people will stumble over when they're looking for this sub. And, and because Jim Hall was making so much money working for the government and doing other stuff, he had to, he had to leave the sub alone. What? It, it, it's, it's really quite an interesting story. And we don't, he wouldn't really say... What he thinks is sunk out there near that sub, or what is near that sub. So that's open to question. But for, there's been a huge cover-up, which, which I meticulously researched and documented in my book, of where, where our local congressman, Congressman Young, inquired with the Navy Department about that sub, and the Navy Department came back and told him it wasn't out there, that it was off Louisiana. They so to the congressman. So maybe somebody should go look again. Not me, not you, but somebody. I'm not going out there. <laughs> no, I wouldn't go out there but either. But there's something out there that the government doesn't want us to know about. All right, Jim. Uh, hold on. Captain Jim Miller is my guest. Wow. Some pretty neat stories, huh? Listen, folks, um, I will tell you uh, how to get Tampa Triangle uh, dead zone when we come back from the break. In the meantime, uh, I just want to drop a quick one on you here. We have two cruises coming up. Cruises. And I live in Tampa, and I'd like to share a story with you and the captain. I delivered papers for the St. Petersburg Times for about eight months, um, starting last August. My paper route encompassed an area northeast of Tampa called Odessa that's sparsely populated in some areas and completely devoid of streetlights except for the occasional house light in the distance. 
One road in particular gave me the shivers at 4.30 in the morning, particularly when listening to your program. It's called Patterson Road. It's not only dark, but it winds with several 90-degree turns that can catch an unsuspecting driver by surprise. It's ver uh, not very uncommon to find cars along the road twisted around trees at these dangerous turns. Well, when I began this route, a fellow delivery person who recently gave up the route asked me about a female jogger that she would see every night along Patterson Road. She told me that she almost hit her every time since she would just appear out of nowhere. I didn't think anything of it until my wife filled in for me about a month after I began in passing. She told me about a jogger that she almost hit while she was driving on Patterson Road the next night. I drove very slowly to try to find the jogger to no avail. Again, I simply forgot about it, the jogger, until my wife subbed for me again and told me about the incident again. I thought hard about it. And I came to the conclusion that I was taking a different route, and therefore I'd drive down Patterson about half an hour earlier than my wife would. I decided to take her route one night and arrive at Patterson Road at exactly the time she normally would. Well, that night I found the jogger appearing instantly as my wife had described, and I was shocked when I saw her, needless to say. After I passed her, I decided to turn around and go back to investigate further. I had my suspicions about this mysterious jogger, and guess what? As I headed back, the jogger disappeared just as she had appeared. Perhaps the captain has heard of this ghost, and if so, could he elaborate at all? That's from James in Tampa. Captain? Well, that gives me chills. I haven't heard about that particular ghost, but it's certainly a good story, an interesting story, and a, a, a spirit that's being seen by several people, too. And it's right down there in the middle of your triangle. The Tampa Triangle Dead Zone. <laughs> Where do people get this book, Captain? Well, you can order through our 800 number. It's 1-800-929-7447. 1-800-929-7447. We've got a website, but it's not as good as yours, Art. Well, no, that's quite all right. Uh, I, what is your website? Our website is www.artquarter, one word, artquarter, A-R-T-Q-U-A-R-T-E-R. Right dot com backslash Tampa Triangle. One word, Tampa Triangle. Wow. Uh, all right, what's on there? Well, we, we've got uh, some excerpts from the book, uh, a little bit of discussion from me. Uh, so there's some interesting things in there. There's also some of the artwork from the cover. we got a killer cover. Uh, and you can also order the book through the website. All right, is that... But you is... are the king of websites. <laughs> I, I looked in my web browser for the top websites, and uh -huh. Art Bell is number one with a bullet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is that a backslash or a forward slash? I believe it's a backslash. I might be mistaken on that. All right, so everybody, be careful there. Try both. www.artquarter.com. Uh, and he says backslash. It I might think be forward backslash. Slash. I might uh, be wrong. And then Tampa Triangle. Okay. Well, I, I'm sure with a uh, uh, with a browser, you could probably go to Tampa. Uh, you know, uh, just enter Tampa Triangle, and I bet you'd get it. Hopefully. All right. Well, hopefully, maybe we could get linked up with you. Well, um, had I known earlier about your website, you would have been. Okay. All right. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with uh, Captain Bill Miller. Hi. Well, uh, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Yes, uh, Captain Miller, uh, you talk about this uh, fog off of Tampa Bay, correct? Could I you... actually witnessed it off of Key Biscayne. Oh, Key Biscayne, I'm sorry. Could this be attributed to, say, possibly air pollution and or a meteorological occurrence as well? Well, I understand what you're saying. I, I am monitor the meteorological conditions very closely when I'm out there. It's a, a natural part of the job, and I'm very experienced with fog. Uh, it, it could, is there any uh, magnetic uh, interference or something like that, too? I, I'm not sure about the magnetic. We had radio interference, and we had a problem with our GPS. And also, um, may I ask? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do, uh, since you're an agent of the government, don't they frown upon your book? I mean, no offense. It seems no, to be... sir, I'm licensed. I'm licensed by the United States Coast Guard. I have, just like you get a driver's license from your state. All right, yes, that I'm... doesn't make him an agent of the government. Well, no, I'm a merchant like seaman. But I thought being in the government uh, or 
involved in the government per se that they would frown upon a book like this. Uh, in, in fact, I can't. Uh, a lot of my friends on the water have said, "Boy, we can't wait till your license goes up for renewal. You're going to have some fun." <laughs> well, <laughs> I see. Well, wait till the Coast Guard deals with you. Yeah. I'm well, look, well, I'm looking forward to your book then. All oh, right. uh, you know, he might be right. I mean, he really might be right. Somebody could take offense to this, and uh, even though you're not an agent of the government, you certainly are licensed by the government. First time caller line, you're on the air with Captain Bill Miller. Hi. Hi, Captain Miller. I have a satellite question. I'm calling from Sonoma County in California. My name is Bruce. Good evening, Bruce. So how are you doing? Terrific. Now, I got this, uh, there's a guy, a Ph.D. named David Allen Lewis. He wrote a book called UFO. Now, he started independent research. He's an archaeologist when Operation Blue Book uh, started doing its research, the Air Force. But he relates one story in his book, and it talks about an unmanned orbiter that the Russians, the USSR, sent up. It orbited Mars. And he said on the Malta Peace Accords uh, between uh, Gorbachev and President Bush, number two on the agenda was UFO discussions. And the Soviet Union was bringing to the table information that they had made contact on Mars. Their unmanned orbiter somehow was contacted by alien life forms. And after the message was transmitted, the whole system was shut down on their satellite. And they lost uh, communication with the satellite, but they did receive the communication they were supposed to deliver. Have you ever heard anything so extraordinary? Well, it doesn't surprise me. And, you know, recently there was a there was talk about sending a, a mission up to explore one of the frozen oceans on one of the uh, moons of Mars, I think it was, up there. And all of a sudden that got squashed real quick. I mean, they shut that down. I thought it was a great actually, idea. Actually, it was Europa. Europa, uh, right. That's right, a uh, moon of Jupiter. Jupiter. All right, here's another one for you, Captain. Uh, you're just not going to believe the, the quality of some of what we're getting in here. Uh, dear Art and Captain Miller, my name is, and I'm going to eliminate it, and I'm a pilot for a major airline. Having been interested in aviation all my life, uh, I have, over the years, compiled a nice aviation library. Most professional pilots, like myself, particularly enjoy reading the technical information, like model development, test pilot reports, and so forth. While reading The Spirit of St. Louis by Charles Lindbergh, I came across something rather interesting in the log of The Spirit. After Lindbergh completed his historic Atlantic crossing, he and his airplane went on an extended tour of the U.S. and neighboring countries. The entire log of the Spirit of St. Louis is contained in the appendix of the book, and the entry for February 13th is as follows. February 13th, Havana to Lambert Field, St. Louis, Missouri, 15 hours, 35 minutes. Both compasses now functioned over the Florida Strait at night. The earth inductor needle wobbled back and forth. The liquid compass card rotated without stopping. Could recognize no stars through heavy haze. Located position at daybreak over Bahama Islands nearly 300 miles off course. Liquid compass card kept rotating until the spirit of St. Louis reached the Florida coast. The spirit made two more flights and then was retired to museum for life. I feel this gives a certain amount of credibility to the Triangle legends, and I think it's interesting that none of the authors of the Triangle books have ever, at least to my knowledge, mentioned this in any of their books. Thought you might find it interesting. He gives the name of his airline and his name, which I will withhold. Captain? sharp guy he's a good researcher too and it, it's fun when when you discover things like this and uh, certainly he he's on the ball with that boy I'll, i had never never heard that and that is in the log of the spirit of st louis anyway um another item very quick facts um captain maybe these people who spontaneously combust have actually died and their souls have gone to hell the, in, uh, the intense heat of hell, if you believe in it, would explain how a human body, which is 70% water, could be consumed so quickly. And uh, I think I'll just leave that one alone. And we'll go to the wild card line. You're on the air with Captain Bill Miller. Hi. Hi, uh, Art. How are you doing? This is Tony in Las Vegas. Hello, Tony. Hi, Bill. Um, 
Uh, I was curious if you uh, had uh, ever heard about two UFOs that were... I'll, I'll try to speak away from my phone a little more. Is that better? You're, you're doing fine, sir. Okay. Um, uh, that were spotted over Santa Barbara in like 19... Uh, I believe it was 48 or something like that. Would that be Santa Barbara in Florida? Uh, no, California. No, uh, he wouldn't know about that, uh, uh, my friend. Uh, he's oh, well, here I... talking about Florida. Uh, hello? 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 Oh, yeah, my hello. phone's cutting out. Oh, is it? Well, we're talking about Florida, and you're talking about okay, Santa Barbara. Okay, I do have a question about Florida. If he oh, thinks okay. that there's a time rift uh, associated with the cloud that the uh, Gulf Breeze sightings were sighted from. Uh huh. Okay, that's worth asking about. You of course know about Gulf Breeze. Oh uh, sure, and what an exciting place that is too right now. An uh, exciting place to be. Do you? Do, where is Gulf Breeze with reference to Tampa, or is it just all of Florida that's weird? Well, when you look at, at Florida, Gulf Breeze is up in the in the curve as as you head towards Louisiana and Mississippi. It's up in that curved part of Florida, uh -huh. up in the Panhandle on the top up there. Uh, Tampa, of course, is is further south, and it's on the west coast. It's on the Gulf of Mexico side. It's about halfway down the state. It's directly across from uh, Cape Canaveral, Cape Kennedy, and the Tampa, tri uh, the Bermuda Triangle. Maybe there's uh, something just generally weird about Florida and the water adjacent to it. Who knows? Um, east of the Rockies, you're on the air with Captain Bill Miller. Hi. Hi, Art. I'm uh, Dave from St. Petersburg, Florida. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you've got us all. Hi, Dave. Uh, I used to be a bridge tender uh, back at the time when the boat that he was talking about that, that crashed into the... Oh, you know about that? Uh, to a certain extent, yes. I was... Um, to give you real quick, there's a Bayway Bridge, which is like right across the, the, the channel, basically, from that bridge, and I could see the skyway from where I was at. Mm -hmm. And that particular morning, uh, he was right. It was uh, really strange uh, how the storm came up rather quickly. But one of the interesting things that happened, uh, there was a car with a couple of golfers that were heading toward Sarasota yes. that particular morning. And they come to a screeching halt up on top of the bridge, just inches from the edge. And when they showed the pictures in the newspaper, here is this automobile. I mean, it's, it, it's metal grating up there at the top is where the old bridge used to be. Huh. And these two uh, golfers, you know, they climbed out and uh the only thing he did he went back to get his um golf clubs he had had them locked up in the trunk and it was just a kind of really amazing how just inches from himself and his partner going off the edge mm -hmm. and uh, he used to run a story in the times that this man uh, until he passed away i believe a few years ago every year commemorating you know the accident he would go up there and uh, leave flowers uh, so, basically, you verify the story the captain uh, told about the collision and the yeah. bridge and all the rest of it. Yeah, I, uh, I have friends. I used to work for the Department of Transportation, and uh, the friends that I worked for actually went out there and helped pull in many uh, people who uh, had passed on and some of the people that were actually survivors that fell off the bridge. There was one incident where the, uh, a man was driving a little pickup truck, and it, uh, the roadway actually fell down onto the ship that hit the, uh, um, the ship, and he bounced and actually survived. Good heavens. Yeah. Uh, so I guess, uh, I guess, Captain, a lot of people down there apparently know about this. Yes, the, the fellow that, his, he rode the bridge down when the, when the bridge collapsed. He fell rode on the, the bridge he down. He rode the bridge down in his little pickup truck. He's the only, only survivor of the people that went. He went out there every year on the anniversary and left white carnations for the victims. And when he passed away a couple of years ago from cancer, uh, he was cremated and his ashes were scattered out there. That was his request. First time caller line, you're on the air with Captain Bill Miller. Hi. Oh, uh, Art, uh, I'm calling from L.A. Okay, you're going to have to kind of yell into your phone. You're not. Okay, not... I'm calling from L.A. Much better. Um, about 10 or 15 minutes ago, someone called in about these. Uh, these five or six uh, saboteurs that landed. Yes. And, uh, well, he, he has it all wrong. Uh, they, they were just young kids, most of them uh, American citizens that had been born in the United States. Or they had been born in Germany but grew up in the United States. Yes. And they, all they did, they wanted to get back home. My husband was involved 
with one of them, Herbie Hopp, H-A-U-P-T. They, they ended up, uh, they wanted to uh, take a trip and see the world, and they ended up in uh, Germany, and, and because they were born there, they were uh, drafted into the Army, and Herbie had a chance to go to a saboteur school in Germany, I mean in Berlin. Had a chance? Well, yeah, you know, to get to be, to go back to the United States on a on a submarine. Yes. And uh, my husband tried to talk him out of it. He said, "You're going to get caught, and you'll be executed." And but he said, "No, no, I'll disappear. Nobody will even find me." So he and he wanted my husband to uh, go with him, and he, you know, my husband didn't want to, but. When he found out that uh, he was going to be sent to the Russian front, he changed his mind. And he did go to uh, Berlin, but by that time, the school had been closed down. Right now, now, this must be the night for first-person testimony. Yeah, but the reason Herbie got caught was because he went to uh, my husband's parents' home in Chicago to uh, let them know that he was okay. And uh, my par- and his parents were arrested because they didn't turn him in. In fact, they... Uh, had uh, been given the death uh, uh, penalty. Penalty, yes. Well, he had that part of it right anyway. All right, thank you very much. God. Um, I don't know where everybody's coming from tonight, but you've touched something in them, Captain. Uh, strange, strange stories indeed. Again, uh, the Tampa, Tampa Triangle, Dead Zone, is available by calling. Give the 800 number if you would. 800-929-7447. All right. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back to you to get a cop. I'm doing tonight. All right, sir. Where are you? Uh, This is Jim. I'm up in Saltville, Virginia. Yes, sir. Mountains in southwest Virginia. Uh, I had kind of a two-part thing here. The first part was uh, one time I read a story about up in, I think it was on the Suwannee River up in the northern part of Florida. There were some sightings of some, like, some giant birds for a short period there, some sort of prehistoric penguin or something. It was really a weird story I read, and I was just wondering if y'all had ever heard about that. Captain? Well, you're, getting, you're starting to get close to Gulf Breeze now. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, it might be more than giant birds. Yeah, well, you know, like I say, it's a pretty unusual story, and, of course, I'm interested in the subject anyway. But the other thing I was wanting to tell you, this is a personal thing. When you was talking about ghosts earlier. Yes, sir. My father died two years ago in the VA hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio. Sorry. And uh, the day before he died, I drove up there and visited him for the last time. And the next morning, I came home, and um, my mother lives here with me at the time. And she left at 3.30 in the morning going to work. But at 5 o'clock, something woke me up. I heard footsteps in my house, and I was the only one here. I'd already knew my mother had done gone to work. I'd heard her leave, and I went back to sleep. At 5 o'clock, I heard footsteps, somebody walking around in my house. Now, for some reason, it didn't bother me. It just it felt natural, and I dozed back off. And the phone rang at 20 minutes after 5, and it was the doctor at the VA hospital in Cincinnati. called me and said my dad had died at 5 o'clock that morning. Mm-hmm. So, I appreciate the story, sir. Thank you. All right, uh, all right. Yes. Let, let me ask you a question, and, and because this, this reminds me of something that I'm looking into now, and that is... Uh, does the body lose weight at the time of death if a soul escapes the body? Well, uh, I, I, for many years, uh, Captain, I looked and I looked and I looked and I searched. And uh, there was a rumor of a medical report indicating that, yes, at uh, the instant of death, there was a three-quarter ounce loss of weight uh, to the physical body. And it, this story remained myth until a physician somehow, out of an obscure medical journal, found a medical study indicating this was exactly so and proved it in a medical study. And I posted that up on my website. Now, I'm sure it's still there somewhere. And I suppose if you go to the website and enter a uh, keyword soul or something like that, you might be able to find it. But the answer is, in one big medical study, yes, three quarters of an ounce at the instant of death and they go into all kinds of gory details about gases and things escaping the body and they were very careful to scientifically uh, be sure that none of that which is what everybody always tries to say had anything to do with it so you tell me 
Wonderful, yes. Uh, wild Card Line, you're on the air with Captain Bill Miller. Hi. Yeah, this is uh, Brad from St. Edward. Yes, sir. Yeah, I guess what? So, uh, uh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. From where? From St. Edward. Where is that? In Nebraska. Oh, okay. Yeah, here in the big plane. So I had a had a, uh, a theory on the uh, on the spontaneous human combustion. You were uh -huh. saying that since the uh, the body was uh, 98 percent water, uh, water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. If you did have a uh, substantial heat source, you might be able to break those down, and I believe hydrogen would be a real a real good f uh, fuel source. Okay, fine. But where do you get that kind of ignition uh, uh, temperature? Yeah, well, uh, what the other caller had said earlier about the uh, the vibration setting up for you. Uh, yeah, it's as good. A, you're right. I mean, it's as good a guess as any. Yeah, it's a good guess. And also, uh, I guess on the theory of ghosts, has anybody ever? Uh, somebody told me one time that uh, their theory was that uh, you can actually see ghosts, but your subconscious mind blocks it out because it's uh, you know too horrific for the conscious mind to take. Or the other way around. Uh, I would think it would be your conscious mind uh, blocking it out and. Um, your subconscious seeing it as if, you, you know, have you ever seen anything sort of at the edge of your peripheral vision? It's there and then it's gone when you turn and look. Uh, maybe something like that. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Captain Bill Miller. Hello. Hi. Hi, where are you? Is that me? That Well, only you know that okay. for certain, but yes. I'm in Dayton, Ohio. Okay. It, mine's Barb. Uh, my dad, I've got a great bunch of ghost stories for you. But I wanted to tell you, first of all, my dad's a retired security specialist out of Wright-Patterson. Uh-huh. Uh, Area 51 or whatever that... No, Area 51 building is here is. in the desert, but uh, Wright, oh, Wright, Wright-Patterson is indeed a very uh, uh, unusual area. Okay. Well, my dad was, uh, he was uh, kind of high up in Secret Service, so I can't say a whole lot. But he's retired and moved to West Virginia. And I uh, had the privilege to live in West Virginia for three years with Dad and, and Mom in a remote area. Yes. And I can't begin to tell you the strange goings-on out there. Well, you can begin. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Give me an idea. Well, um, I was... I stayed in a mobile... in a trailer and mom and dad lived in the house in the house the house is haunted okay i won't stay there by myself no not not okay i mean a haunted house it is um we hear footsteps at night we, we i've seen uh i've seen black uh like black shadows and uh, the girl that stayed there she's seen three women uh at the back door and she went out and they were gone that would do it we hear uh, we hear all kinds of things like doors opening. Um, I mean, you know, it's it's really. I'd I'd be more than happy to give you a key to the trailer, and you can go out there and stay a week. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, actually, um, Captain Miller, I was once uh, very close. I was very very interested in investigating. Uh, ghosts, and I actually had an open offer to my audience. You know, if somebody could actually uh, invite me to a place where I could see a ghost, I was ready to go. I think that I've changed my mind about that. I might still do it, but you know, I I, I really don't know if I would want to see something like that. Would you? I don't know. It's pretty creepy stuff. There's no doubt about that. I, I personally haven't seen one, but... Uh... No, I didn't ask that. I said, if you had an opportunity to go to a place where you could see one, where uh, things were constantly occurring, would you make the conscious choice to go and see it, or would you think about it and stay away? Oh, I'd go and see it. You'd go and see it? Sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Captain Bill Miller. Hi. Uh, good evening, Mr. Miller and Art. Uh, it's Captain Miller and uh, just plain Art. Right. Hey, Art. Yeah, this is uh, your fellow Gemini up here in Yuba City, California. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I got a quickie little story. Uh, Captain Miller probably might have heard of it. You two should have heard of it. But uh, a quick sidebar on that uh, instant, uh, uh, what do you call it, combustion? 
I, uh, yes, sir. Uh, instant combustion, indeed. Okay, 1982, there was a gunpowder company. They invented something. It was for black powder enthusi enthusiasts. It was called golden powder. It was 99% biodegradable ingredients. When it was ignited, it was, all, it was pure moisture. But uh, since then, they've been bought out, and nobody knows whatever happened to them. Huh. So they got me to thank them, you know. Uh, Think about it for a second. That's, uh... <laughs> All right. Well, it might be. Uh, spontaneous human combustion is actually the phrase, but it occurs apparently instantly. Um, Captain, in the, in the uh, story you told us, was there any way to know how quickly that person uh, immolated? Well, she went to bed about... Uh... She was last seen, I believe, around 9.30 or 10 o'clock that night, maybe a little bit later, by her son, yes. who gave her a sleeping pill. Uh, and then she was discovered the next morning around 6.30, I believe, 6.30 in the morning. So, Interestingly enough, hmm. librarians are one of my favorite sources of information, and there's a, a librarian in St. Petersburg who told me about a second case of spontaneous human combustion. I looked it up in the files, and sure enough, there was another woman that spontaneously human combusted in... Uh, St. Petersburg in 1968, the same night that Janis Joplin was ripping up the stage in Tampa and getting arrested for swearing at the cops, this woman uh, spontaneously human combusted. So uh, that was kind of interesting. You're, you're not connecting Janis Joplin to it, are you? Well, they were both setting the town on fire. <laughs> but, you know, it's fun when you go back through the microfilm to see the different things. Good to have a sense of humor, too. First time caller line, you're on the air with Captain Bill Miller. Hi. How are you doing, Art right, Bill? Oh, uh, fine. Where are you? I'm in Addie, Washington. Okay. Um, I was in high school in uh, a suburb of northern Chicago, Highland Park. Uh, I slept, but her parents went out of town. My girlfriend and I, you know, uh, the parents are out of town. You know, the cat's away. We woke up 4 o'clock in the morning. I went to the bathroom. At, the, at, at 7 o'clock in the morning, we woke up, and the bed was in the middle of the room. And I said, Tony, what, what, what's going on here? She goes, it happens all the time, all kinds of... She lived in one of the oldest houses in that, in that area, which right. is right along the lake shore. She says, there's all kinds of stuff. She said, we eat dinner, we hear people running up and down. Uh, there's only three of us in the household. We hear children and, and noise running up and down the hallway. In the, in the I'd be out of there so fast. Oh, no, I thought it was neat. <laughs> All right, all right for you, all you people who love this kind of thing. Uh, I'm intrigued by it, but uh, I don't know that I would go and seek it out. Uh, I might. Wild card line, you're on the air with Captain Bill Miller. Hi. Hi, thank you very much, and, uh, you know, good evening to both of you. Good evening. Where are you? Uh, Seminole, Florida, and, uh, of course, I'm about 20 minutes from Clearwater. Uh, I first have a comment and a question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> first, the, uh, the Mary uh, picture that's on the uh, finance building in, in Clearwater yes. is quite um, realistic when, when you're actually uh, there in person looking at it. Because, You've been uh, there. You've seen it. Yes. Yeah, of course, I had to take the chance, and it's still there right now, actually. It's been there since uh, just before Christmas. I would, would you turn your radio off for us, please? Oh, excuse me, just a second, sure. It's quite all right. Uh, so that Marian apparition uh, not only was there, but is there, remains there now. Yes. And uh, it, it looks quite uh, uh, much more human in person, like I said. The, there are almost features, but it it's not really doesn't have any uh, facial features that are distinct, but uh, it looks much more human in person. Well, you heard, I think, what I said about it earlier. Let me ask you, caller, why, why do you think we're having so much of this now? What's your best guess? Uh, well, for those who, uh, you know, many messages come, or the, the messages come in many different forms, I, I suppose, and and that touches a certain segment of the population, and, and uh, you know, I'm not Catholic, but I I, uh, you know, consider Mary quite important, and, uh, you know, that was something that was pretty interesting to, to see in person, uh, because it's been there for so long, and, uh, and it really can't be explained away as far as I can tell, because it is about three uh, stories tall, and now they say that the, uh, the finance building that it is on is uh, going to be turned, you know, into some religious uh, uh, building when, it's, when they're through with it, you know, when the, the current documents are, are done with it. Well, I'm, you know, I am not a Catholic. My wife is. Um, but I can feel it. 
I can feel it, and I think most people can too. We're being sent a message, and obviously in that case, it was a big one. Mm -hmm. And my question is, what are the uh, coordinates for the, uh, or the general coordinates for the, the uh, Tampa Triangle? Oh, okay. Oh, that's a good, uh, very good question. Uh, Captain, can you tell us that uh, roughly? What the yeah, I, that, that's a real good question. I get asked that a lot. I don't think you can put definitive boundaries on the paranormal or on a psychic atmosphere. Uh, it's not like a county line or a state state line on a road map or something like that. Yeah. But pretty much the the area of the most intense paranormal activity is centered seems to be centered right around the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, and it extends up north towards. Uh, Harpen Springs and Cedar Key, and then as far south as Charlotte Harbor and Fort Myers. <laughs> For, um, east of the Rockies, actually. You're on the air with Captain Bill Miller. Hi. Hi, Tim from La Crosse. La Crosse, Wisconsin. Yes, sir. Yep. Let me get this radio on. All right. Uh, we don't have a lot of time here, so... Uh... Okay. Uh, I just got a couple of comments on spontaneous human combustion. Yes. Uh, spontaneous human combustion in the east, I've heard it to be uh, a yogi trick of death as far as, as uh, to dematerialize your body you send your all your energy out of your solar plexus and you your body dematerializes and also an uh, interesting piece uh, I read in a book was this guy who saw this National Geographic show and uh, uh, he saw the Tibetan monks there uh, steaming off uh, wet towels, ice wet towels, uh, uh, sheets of their bodies hmm. using self heat. Uh, so you're saying they were generating that heat? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you can generate, you have a cold channel, a hot channel, and a neutral channel, uh, three main channels that your energy can flow through. And, uh, I guess what, what they were doing was channeling it obviously through their channel so all right well i appreciate that uh i don't have the slightest idea what could cause a human being to spontaneously combust it's beyond me totally uh and i guess everybody will just have to think what they think uh captain we're about out of time anything uh you want to say as a final word to everybody out there real quickly one of the most rewarding things about writing this book was a phone call i received the other night from a woman who runs a bookstore she has three sons the youngest of which suffers from attention de deficit disorder. Yes. Uh, the, here's a woman that owns a bookstore and can't get her youngest son to read. He won't look at books. He won't do anything. She finally gave him a copy of the Tampa Triangle Dead Zone. And away he went. He actually read it. He got an A, a <laughs> book report, uh, uh, an A on his book report, and it's opened a whole... She said it's turned his life around, and then she started crying. A so that, for me, that was very touching. So a very motiv motivational book as well, I guess. So way, huh? maybe it, it takes a different book, a little something different than Dick and Jane to get these kids excited and, and to turn them on. And Maybe and it does. And if they want Tampa Triangle Dead Zone, they should call 1-800... I'm going to let you finish, Captain. 1-800-929-7447. All right, my friend, I thank you for being here. I'm sorry we have but three hours on this program. Probably could have done much more. Captain, we'll have you back sometime. Thank you. You're the best, Art Bell. Take care. Uh, that's Captain Bill Miller. If you want a copy of this program, the number is 1-800-917-4278. That's 1-800-917-4278. Tampa Triangle, Dead Zone. I'm Art Bell. From the high desert to wherever you are, good night. This has been Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped. Yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. Please join us again next week at this time for Dreamland.